Chapter twenty two of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter twenty two The Mutineers A Tale of the Sea there is scarce any one we apprehend who is in any considerable degree conversant with the shifting scenes of human existence who does not know that many of the plain narratives of common life possess an indescribable charm these unvarnished details of human weal and human woe coming right from the mint of nature decline the superfluous embellishments of art and in the absence of all borrowed lustre clearly demonstrate that they are adorned the most when unadorned they bear a most diametrical contrast to those figments of diseased fancy that nauseating romance about virgins betrothed and lady love which in so many instances elbow decency and common sense from the pages of our periodical literature as unwelcome guests it has frequently been said that sailors above every other class of men have irrepressible hankerings after the wild and wonderful certain it is that he who will sit on a ship's foresail of a bright moonlight evening will hear of hair-breadth escapes and perilous adventures no less chivalrous and incredible than those which cervantes and the biographer of baron munchausen have attributed to their respective heroes although the following incidents may excite no very thrilling interest they have at least the merit of truth the actors in this short drama are still on the stage ready to testify to this narrative of facts on the morning of the fourteenth of april eighteen twenty eight the ship gold hunter glided majestically out of the liverpool docks with fair wind and tide the mersey from liverpool to black rock a distance of about three miles was literally covered with vessels of every character and nation which had taken advantage of the fair wind to clear the harbour here might be seen the little french lugger carrying back to bordeaux what its fruit and brandy had bought as frisky in its motions as the nervous monsieur who commanded it at a little distance the square-shouldered antwerper sitting on the elevated poop of his galliot was enjoying with his crew a glorious smoke you could almost see them and that too without very keen optics put care into their tobacco pipes anxiety curled in fume over their heads a not unfrequent sight was the star-spangled banner floating in beauty over the bosom of the wave the serenity of the atmosphere the ever-changing brilliancy of the scene the tout ensemble were well calculated to excite the most pleasurable emotions everything seemed to give the most flattering assurances of a voyage of unruffled peacefulness this large squadron continued comparatively unbroken until it reached holyhead where such vessels as were bound for scotland or the north of ireland bore away from those which were bound down the channel the gold hunter whose destination was a port in the united states was of course in company with the latter class those on board of her very naturally felt great gratification in perceiving that she was not only the most splendid and graceful ship but the swiftest sailor in sight before we proceed farther however we must in some measure acquaint the reader with the inmates of the gold hunter notwithstanding she was one of those floating palaces eclept liverpool packets and the captain a finished gentleman and skilful navigator there were on this trip but two cabin passengers an irish gentleman who had a short time before sold his lieutenancy in the british army and his sister the former had been engaged in some of england's fiercest battles and won some of her brightest laurels the reason which induced him to dispose of his commission and forsake the hardships and honours of military life was a desire to visit some near relations who at an early period had emigrated to this country and who were now enjoying respectability and a competence it was for this object that mr kelly and his sister had taken passage in the gold hunter 
at the time of which we are now speaking it need hardly be said that they felt towards each other all that deep-toned and romantic affection which in so characteristic a manner pervades irish relationships the captain who was a man of fine feeling and cultivated intellect spent most of his leisure moments in their company and many an evening when the moonbeams played forth brightly on the rippling water and the bellying of the canvas seemed to assure them they were hastening to the tender embraces of those they loved would they sit together on the quarter-deck while miss kelly enhanced the brilliancy of the scene by singing some of those wild touching melodies which she had learned to warble on her own native hills thus time trod on flowers and the incidental privations and inconveniences of a sea voyage were greatly mitigated nothing worthy of special notice occurred until about the twenty fifth of april when mr kelly who was walking on the weather side of the main deck accidentally overheard the following conversation between three or four of the crew engaged in caulking the seams just under the lee of the long-boat i tell you once for all a cargo of silks and broadcloths ain't a going to do us any good without the ready cash ready cash why man how many times must i tell you that there is specie on board the old man has two or three thousand dollars and kelly has a bag of sovereigns or my eyes never saw salt water and the girl said a third voice which mr kelly knew to be the steward's and the girl did not jingle her bag for nothing the other day when she walked by me something there or my head's a ball of spun yarn kelly was transfixed with utter horror and amazement but fearful lest one might perceive him he crouched under the long-boat which afforded him a partial concealment in this situation he listened with breathless anxiety to the development of their plans so murderous that his very blood ran cold in his veins when the villains came to the blackest most awful portions of their scheme their voices were instinctively hushed into almost a whisper so that it was only the general outline that kelly could gather he found that it was their intention to wait until some dark dismal night when they would rush on the captain himself and sister and murder them in their beds rifle them of their money and take possession of the ship it was their design to spare the life of the mate whose services they needed as a navigator after having done all this they were to steer directly for the coast of africa where they hoped to dispose of the cargo to the negroes if successful they expected to carry thence to the west indies a load of slaves if not to abandon the ship entirely taking with them the specie and whatever light articles of value they conveniently could they anticipated no difficulty in introducing themselves into some of the settlements on the coast as shipwrecked mariners and as vessels frequently left the settlements for the united states they supposed they might procure a passage without exciting any suspicion kelly was a man of such imperturbable self-command that he found no difficulty in repressing every symptom which could indicate his knowledge of the diabolical conspiracy it was no part of his intention however to conceal anything from captain newton to the captain therefore he made an unreserved disclosure of all that had come to his knowledge at first they were at a loss what measure to take one thing they thought of the greatest importance which was to keep miss kelly in entire ignorance of what was transpiring on board some uncurbed outbreaking of alarm would be almost certain such was the excitability of her temperament this in their present situation might be attended with the most disastrous consequences the captain determined to eye with particular vigilance the motions of harmon who from the part he took in the conversation alluded to above appeared to be the ringleader here in order that the reader may fully understand the narrative it becomes necessary for us to make a very short digression the government of a ship is in the strictest sense of the term monarchical the captain holding undivided and absolute authority the relation he sustains to the sailor resembles very much that of the master to the slave consequently in order that this relation be not severed by the sailor even the faintest colour of insubordination must be promptly quelled 
if any master of a ship suffer a sailor to make an impertinent reply with impunity he immediately finds his authority prostrate and trampled upon and his most positive commands pertinaciously disregarded the day after that on which mr kelly had communicated the startling intelligence to the captain was somewhat squally the latter was standing on the weather side of the quarter-deck giving directions to the man at the helm who happened to be harman respecting the steering of the ship luff luff keep her full and by mind your weather helm or she'll be all in the wind down with it or she'll be off i tell you if you don't steer the ship better i'll send you from the helm you don't keep her within three points of her course either way all this was said of course in a pretty authoritative tone and harman impudently replied i can steer as well as you or any other man in the ship captain newton's philosophy was completely dashed by this daring answer and he immediately gave harman a blow with his fist which harman as promptly returned sprawling the captain on the deck harman then deserted the helm leaving the ship to the mercy of the tempest and hurried forward to the foresail hoping there to entrench himself so firmly as to resist all attacks from without the captain as soon as he could recover from his amazement went to the cabin door and cried out mr kelly our lives are in danger will you assist me my dear sir to secure one of my men that cut-throat harmon we must blow up his scheme in the outset or we are gone kelly had too little coolness in his constitution to stop to discuss the matter when he knew that the life of a dear sister might depend on the issue he saw in a moment that the conspirators would take courage unless they were immediately overpowered he therefore instantly joined captain newton and they proceeded to the foresail together threats and commands had not virtue enough to bring harmon from his hiding-place some more effectual expedient must be resorted to accordingly brimstone was introduced into the numerous crevices of the foresail and the atmosphere rendered insufferable frantic with suffocation his eyes flashing with rage he brandished savagely a huge case knife you newton and you kelly i swear that if i am obliged to leave this foresail i'll sheath this knife in your breast you infernal tormentors like the chafed wounded maddened bull which his pursuers have surrounded and which is drawing close about him his dying strength for one last furious charge was harmon when kelly with most provoking coolness said harmon you shall leave that foresail or die there it soon became evident that he was making preparations to leave they therefore planted themselves firmly near the gangway through which alone he could possibly come out soon he bolted furiously through making as he passed a desperate plunge at captain newton with his enormous case knife had not mr kelly at this moment by a dexterous effort struck harmon's arm one more immortal spirit would have been disencumbered of this coil of mortality instead of this the villain was disarmed and his dangerous weapon danced about harmlessly on the top of the waves harmon was now powerless and they found no difficulty in putting irons upon him during the whole of this contest his associates did not dare to offer him the least assistance on the contrary each stood silently apart eyeing his neighbour with fear and distrust when mr kelly returned to the cabin he found that his sister had fainted away through terror volatile salts and the assurance that all her future fears would be entirely groundless had the effect of restoring her very speedily on the morning of the twenty third of may charleston lighthouse was descried from the masthead not a remnant of apprehension lurked behind every pulse beat gladly anticipated joys filled every bosom it was not long before the revenue cutter from which floats the stripes and the stars was seen bounding over the billows towards the gold hunter she was soon alongside and after an interchange of salutations between the vessels the commander of the revenue cutter boarded the ship after many inquiries captain newton requested the united states officer to step into the cabin where he laid open all the circumstances connected with the abortive conspiracy 
"'Captain Morris,' said he, "'I shall be obliged to call on you for assistance "'in bringing these men to punishment.' "'Such as I can grant,' replied Captain M, "'is at your service. "'But how shall we proceed?' "'Put the men into irons, "'and then I consign them to your safe keeping.' "'These intentions were announced on deck, "'and if ever consternation and rueful dismay "'were depicted in human countenances, "'it was in the case of those "'who had entered into the conspiracy, "'but who, till now, "'had supposed that all their plans "'were enveloped in midnight secrecy.' manacles were put on them without difficulty and they soon found themselves secured lodged on board a united states vessel at the fall term of the supreme court of south carolina four men were arraigned on an indictment of mutiny on the high seas on board the ship gold hunter the evidence was so conclusive that all the ingenuity of the prisoner's counsel twist itself as it would could effect nothing the jury found a verdict of guilty without leaving their seats. Harmon was sentenced to the penitentiary five years, the others four years each. Thus was a most dangerous indevotion frustrated. End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 23 Fate of Seven Sailors Who Were Left on the Island of St. Maurice. The Dutch, who frequented the northern regions during the more favorable season of the year in pursuit of the whale fishery, became desirous of ascertaining the state of different places while winter prevailed. Various opinions were entertained concerning this subject, and astronomers wished to have their sentiments regarding certain natural phenomena either realized or controverted. Besides, a more important object was concealed under these ostensible reasons, namely, whether the establishment of permanent colonies in the most remote parts of greenland was practicable a proposal was therefore promulgated through the greenland fleet for seven seamen to offer to remain a winter in st maurice's island and also for other seven to winter in spitzbergen we are not acquainted with the inducements held forth but it is probable that little hesitation ensued for we find a party prepared to winter at the different places specified nearly about the same period seven of the stoutest and ablest men of the fleet having accordingly agreed to be left behind their comrades sailed from st maurice's isle on the twenty sixth of august sixteen thirty three the people two days afterwards shared half a pound of tobacco to which they restricted themselves as a weekly allowance at this time there was no night, and the heat of the sun so powerful through the day that they pulled off their shirts and sported on the side of a hill near their abode. Great abundance of seagulls frequented the island, and the seamen made a constant practice of seeking for vegetables growing there for salad. Towards the end of September the weather began to be tempestuous, and in the earlier part of October their huts were so much shaken by violent storms of wind that their nightly rest was interrupted but they did not resort to firing until the ninth of that month. About a week subsequent, two whales were cast ashore, and the seamen immediately endeavored to kill them with harpoons, lances, and cutlasses, but the tide flowing enabled them to escape. As winter advanced, bears became so numerous that the people durst scarce venture abroad from their huts towards night, but in the daytime some were occasionally killed, which they roasted several of these animals were so strong however that they would run off after being shot through a great many gulls were also seen on the seaside which retired every night to the mountains their usual place of retreat the first of january sixteen thirty four was ushered in with dark and frosty weather the seamen after wishing each other a happy new year and good success in their enterprise went to prayers two bears approached very near their huts but the darkness of the day and the depth of the snow rendered it impossible to take them not long afterwards the seamen were more successful and having shot one dragged it into a hut where they skinned it 
From the 1st of February, these animals became very shy and were seldom seen. In the month of March, all the people were attacked by scurvy, owing to the scarcity of fresh provisions, and their spirits sunk with the progress of the disease. Only two were in health on the 3rd of April, while the rest were extremely ill. Two pullets were at their request killed for them, no more being left, and as their appetites were pretty good, the others entertained hopes of their convalescence. The whole seldom left their hut to examine the appearance of the sea or the surrounding country, but on the 15th they observed four whales in a neighboring bay. The clerk was now very ill and died on the 16th, whereupon the surviving mariners invoked heaven to have mercy on his soul and also on themselves, for they suffered severely. No fresh provisions whatever were left, and they daily grew worse, partly from want of necessary articles and partly from the excessive cold. Even when in health they could scarce keep themselves in heat by exercise, and when sick and unable to stir from their huts, that remedy was at an end. Disease made rapid progress among these unfortunate people, so that on the 23rd not more than one individual could give an account of the rest, which is done in these words of his journal. We are by this time reduced to a deplorable state, none of my comrades being able to help himself, much less another. The whole burden, therefore, lies on my shoulders, and I shall perform my duty as well as I am able, so long as it pleases God to give me strength. I am just now about to assist our commander out of his cabin. He thinks it will relieve his pain, for he is struggling with death. The night is dark, and wind blowing from the south. Meantime the Dutch, who repaired in the summer season to Greenland, became impatient to learn the fate of the seven men left in the Isle of St. Maurice. Some of the seamen got into a boat immediately on their arrival, on the 4th of June, 1634, and hastened towards the huts. Yet from none of the others having come to the seaside to welcome them, they presaged nothing good, and accordingly found that all the unfortunate men had breathed their last. The first, as has been seen, expired on the 16th of April, 1634, and his comrades, having put his body in a coffin, deposited it in one of the huts. The remainder were conjectured to have died about the beginning of May from a journal kept by them expressing that, on the 27th of April, they had killed their dog for want of fresh provisions and from its termination on the last of this month. Near one of the bodies stood some bread and cheese, on which the mariner had perhaps subsisted immediately preceding his decease. A box of ointment lay beside the cabin of another, with which he had rubbed his teeth and joints, and his arm was still extended towards his mouth. A prayer book, which he had been reading, also lay near him. Each of the men was found in his own cabin. The commodore of the Greenland fleet, having got this melancholy intelligence, ordered the six bodies to be put into coffins, and, along with the seventh, deposited beneath the snow. Afterwards, when the earth thawed, they were removed, and interred on St. John's Day, under a general discharge of the cannon of the fleet. End of chapter 23section twenty four of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by philip gould thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous section twenty four seamen wintering in spitzbergen on the 30th of August, 1633, the Dutch fleet sailed from North Bay in Spitsbergen, leaving seven men behind, who had agreed to winter there. Immediately on departure of the vessels, they began to collect a sufficient quantity of provisions to serve their necessities until their comrades should return in the subsequent year. Therefore, at different times, they hunted reindeer with success, and caught many sea-fowl and also occasionally got herbs which proved very salutary. Excursions both by sea and land were frequently made when the weather would permit, and they endeavored to kill whales and narwhals in the different bays on the east coast of Spitsbergen. The extreme cold of the climate was announced by the disappearance of all the feathered tribe on the 3rd of October, and from that time it gradually augmented. 
On the thirteenth their casks of beer were frozen three inches thick, and very soon afterwards, though standing within eight feet of the fire, they froze from top to bottom. The seamen had broke the ice on the sea, and disposed a net for catching fish below it, but the rigor of the weather constantly increasing, the ice formed a foot thick at the surface in the space of two hours. From the excessive cold they remained almost constantly in bed, and notwithstanding they had both a grate and a stove, they were sometimes obliged to rise and take violent exercise to keep themselves in heat. Beautiful phenomena appeared in the sky during winter, consisting of the aurora borealis of surprising splendor and magnitude, and other meteors seeming to arise from the icy mountains. On the 3rd of March the mariners had an encounter with a monstrous bear, in which one of them very nearly perished. The animal became furious from its wounds. Leaping against a seaman about to pierce it with his lance, it threw him down, and, but for the opportune interposition of another, would have torn him to pieces. At length, after suffering many hardships and privations, the mariners were gladdened with the sight of a boat rowing into the bay on the 27th of May, 1634, announcing the return of a Dutch Greenland man, which anchored there the same evening. The Dutch, encouraged by the safety of this party, proposed that other seven people, provided with all necessaries, should pass the following winter in their place, and accordingly Andrew Johnson, Cornelius Thies, Jerome Kirkoen, Tib Kegelis, Nicholas Florison, Adrian Johnson, and Fetty Otters offered to remain. The fleet therefore sailed for Holland on the 11th of September, 1634, leaving these men behind. Numbers of whales were in sight of Spitzbergen on the same day, which the people made an unsuccessful attempt to catch. Towards the end of November, scurvy beginning to appear among them, they carefully sought for green herbs, but in vain. Nor were they more fortunate in pursuit of bears and foxes for fresh provisions. However, they drank some potions and took other antidotes against the disease, and they set traps for foxes. A bear being discovered on the 24th of November, three of the people eagerly proceeded to attack it, for their necessities were daily becoming greater. The animal, rising to receive them on its hind legs, was shot through the body, whereupon it began to bleed and roar most hideously, and fiercely bit a halberd but, likely to be overpowered, it took to flight and was anxiously pursued by the people a long way, carrying lanhorns, though unsuccessfully, and they were all much dispirited from the disappointment of fresh provision which they so much required. On the 14th of January Adrian Johnson died. The whole of the rest were extremely ill. Fetty Otters died the next day, and also Cornelius Thies on the 17th, a man in whom his comrades rested their chief hope next to God. Notwithstanding the weakness of the survivors who could scarce support themselves on their legs, they contrived to make three coffins for the deceased and put their bodies into them. In the beginning of February they had the good fortune to catch a fox, an incident which afforded them much satisfaction, but at the time disease had gone too far to admit their deriving material benefit from the flesh. Many bears, even six or ten together, were seen, but the people had not strength to manage their guns, nor, had it been otherwise, were they able to pursue them. Now they were seized with excruciating pains about the loins and belly, which were aggravated by cold. One spit blood, and another was afflicted with a bloody flux, yet Jerome Carcoen could still bring in fuel to keep up the fires. The sun had disappeared on the 20th of October nor was he seen again until the 24th of February, when the mariners were so weak as to be constantly confined to their cabins. Two days after, they ceased to be able to write, at that time expressing themselves in a journal thus. Four of us who still survive lie flat on the floor of our hut. We think we could still eat, were there only one among us able to get fuel, but none can move for pain. Our time is spent in constant prayer that God in His mercy would deliver us from this misery. We are ready whenever He pleases to call us. Assuredly we cannot long survive without food or firing, 
we are unable to assist each other in our mutual afflictions, and each must bear his own burden. The seamen of the Dutch fleet arriving at Spitzbergen in 1635 hastened to inquire after the fate of their comrades, and having found their hut all closed around as a protection against wild beasts, they broke open the back door. A man then entering ran up the stairs where he discovered part of a dead dog on the floor, laid there to dry, and quickly descending trod on the carcass of another dog, also dead. Thence passing towards the front door, he stumbled in the dark over several dead bodies, which after the door was opened were seen lying together. Three were in coffins, Nicholas Florison and another, each in a cabin, and the other two on some sails covering the floor, lying with their knees drawn up to their chins. Therefore the whole of these unfortunate people had perished. Coffins were prepared for the four bodies wanting them, and all were buried under the snow, until the ground became more penetrable when they were deposited in the earth beside each other, and stones laid on their graves to preserve them from the ravenous beasts of prey. End of section 24. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 25 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. A MAN OVERBOARD Sailors are men of rough habits, but their feelings are not by any means so coarse. If they possess little prudence or worldly consideration, they are likewise very free from selfishness. Generally speaking, too, they are much attached to one another, and will make great sacrifices to their messmates or shipmates when opportunities occur. I remember once, when cruising off Tercera in the Endymion, that a man fell overboard and was drowned. After the usual confusion, and long search in vain, the boats were hoisted up, and the hands called to make sail. I was officer of the forecastle, and on looking about to see if all the men were at their station, missed one of the foretopmen. Just at that moment I observed someone curled up, and apparently hiding himself under the bow of the barge, between the boat and the booms. Hello, I said. Who are you? What are you doing there, you skulker? Why are you not at your station? I am not skulking, said the poor fellow, the furrows in whose bronzed and weather-beaten cheek were running down with tears. The man we had just lost had been his messmate and friend, he told me for ten years. I begged his pardon, in full sincerity, for having used such harsh words to him at such a moment, and bid him go below to his berth for the rest of the day. "'Never mind, sir, never mind,' said the kind-hearted seaman. "'It can't be helped. You meant no harm, sir. I am as well on deck as below. Bill's gone, sir, but I must do my duty.' So saying, he drew the sleeve of his jacket twice or thrice across his eyes, and mustering his grief within his breast, walked to his station as if nothing had happened. In the same ship, and nearly about the same time, the people were bathing alongside in a calm at sea. It is customary on such occasions to spread a studding sail on the water by means of lines from the fore and main yard arms for the use of those who either cannot swim or who are not expert in this art, so very important to all seafaring people. Half a dozen of the ship's boys were floundering about in the sails and sometimes even venturing beyond the leech rope. One of the least of these urchins, but not the least courageous of their number, when taunted by his more skillful companions with being afraid, struck out boldly beyond the prescribed bounds. He had not gone much further than his own length, however, along the surface of the fathomless sea, when his heart failed him, poor little man. 
and along with his confidence away also went his power of keeping his head above the water. So down he sank rapidly, to the speechless horror of the other boys, who of course could lend the drowning child no help. The captain of the forecastle, a tall, fine-looking, hard-a-weather fellow, was standing on the shank of the sheet-anchor with his arms across, and his well-varnished canvas hat drawn so much over his eyes that it was difficult to tell whether he was awake or merely dozing in the sun as he leaned his back against the fore-topmast backstay. The seaman, however, had been attentively watching the young party all the time, and, rather fearing that mischief might ensue from their rashness, he had grunted out a warning to them from time to time, to which they paid no sort of attention. At last he desisted, saying they might drown themselves if they had a mind, for never a bit would he help them. But no sooner did the sinking figure of the adventurous little boy catch his eye than, diver fashion, he joined the palms of his hands over his head, inverted his position in one instant, and urging himself into swifter motion by a smart push with his feet against the anchor, shot head foremost into the water. The poor lad sunk so rapidly that he was at least a couple of fathoms under the surface before he was arrested by the grip of the sailor, who soon rose again, bearing the bewildered boy in his hand, and calling to the other youngsters to take better care of their companion, chucked him right into the belly of the sail. The foresheet was hanging in the calm, nearly into the water, and by it the dripping seaman scrambled up again to his old berth on the anchor, shook himself like a great Newfoundland dog, and then, jumping on the deck, proceeded across the forecastle to shift himself. At the top of the ladder he was stopped by the marine officer, who had witnessed the whole transaction as he sat across the gangway hammocks, watching the swimmers and trying to get his own consent to undergo the labor of undressing. Said the soldier to the sailor, "'That was very well done of you, my man, and right well deserves a glass of grog. Say so to the gunroom steward as you pass, and tell him it is my orders to fill you out a stiff norwester.' The soldier's offer was kindly meant, but rather clumsily timed, at least so thought Jack. For though he inclined his head in acknowledgment of the attention, and instinctively touched his hat when spoken to by an officer, he made no reply till, out of the Marine's hearing, when he laughed, or rather chuckled out to the people near him, "'Does the good gentleman suppose I'll take a glass of grog for saving a boy's life?' End of a man overboard recording by james k white chula vista chapter 26 of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by melvin lee Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous Chapter 26 An Escape Through the Cabin Windows In the year 18... Blank, said Captain M. I was bound in a fine stout ship of about 400 tons burden from the port of... Blank, to Liverpool. The ship had a valuable cargo on board and about $90,000 in specie. I had been prevented by other urgent business from giving much attention to the vessel while loading and equipping for the voyage, but was very particular in my directions to the chief mate, in whom I had great confidence, he having sailed with me some years, to avoid entering, if possible, any but Native American seamen. When we were about to sail, he informed me that he had not been able to comply with my directions entirely in this particular, but had shipped two foreigners as seamen, one a native of Guernsey, and the other a Frenchman from Brittany. I was pleased, however, with the appearance of the crew generally, and particularly with the foreigners. They were both stout and able-bodied men, and were particularly alert and attentive to orders. The passage commenced auspiciously, and promised to be a speedy one, as we took a fine, steady, westerly wind 
soon after we lost soundings to my great sorrow and uneasiness i soon discovered in the foreigners a change of conduct for the worse they became insolent to the mates and appeared to be frequently under the excitement of liquor and had evidently acquired an undue influence with the rest of the men their intemperance soon became intolerable and as it was evident that they had brought liquor on board with them i determined upon searching the forecastle and depriving them of it an order to this effect was given to the mates and they were directed to go about its execution mildly and firmly taking no arms with them as they seemed inclined to do but to give every chest berth and locker in the forecastle a thorough examination and bring aft to my cabin any spirits they might find it was not without much anxiety that i sent them forward upon this duty i remained upon the quarter-deck myself ready to go to their aid should it be necessary in a few moments a loud and angry dispute was succeeded by a sharp scuffle around the forecastle companionway the steward at my call handed my loaded pistols from the cabin and with them i hastened forward the frenchman had grappled the second mate who was a mere lad by the throat thrown him across the heel of the bowsprit and was apparently determined to strangle him to death the chief mate was calling for assistance from below where he was struggling with the guernsey man the rest of the crew were indifferent spectators but rather encouraging the foreigners than otherwise i presented a pistol at the head of the frenchman and ordered him to release the second mate which he instantly did and then ordered him into the foretop and the others who were near into the main top none to come down under pain of death until ordered the steward had by this time brought another pair of pistols with which i armed the second mate directing him to remain on deck and went below into the forecastle myself i found that the chief mate had been slightly wounded in two places by the knife of his antagonist who however ceased to resist as i made my appearance and we immediately secured him in irons the search was now made and a quantity of liquor found and taken to the cabin the rest of the men were then called down from the tops and the frenchman was made the companion his coadjutor's confinement i then expostulated at some length with the others upon their improper and insubordinate conduct and upon the readiness with which they had suffered themselves to be drawn into such courses by two rascally foreigners and expressed hopes that i should have no reason for further complaint upon the rest of the voyage this remonstrance i thought had effect as they appeared contrived and promised amendment they were then dismissed and order was restored the next day the foreigners strongly solicited pardon with the most solemn promises of future good conduct and as the rest of the crew joined in their request i ordered that their irons should be taken off for several days the duties of the ship were performed to my entire satisfaction but i could discover in the countenances of the foreigners expressions of deep and rancorous animosity to the chief mate who was a prompt energetic seaman requiring from the sailors at all times ready and implicit obedience to his orders a week perhaps had passed over in this way when one night in the mid-watch all hands were called to shorten sail ordinarily upon occasions of this kind the duty was conducted by the mate but i now went upon deck myself and gave orders sending him upon the forecastle the night was dark and squally but the sea was not high and the ship was running off about nine knots with the wind upon the starboard quarter the weather being very unpromising the second reef was taken in the foretop and mainsails the mizzen handed and the fore and mizzen top gallant yard sent down this done one watch was permitted to go below and i prepared to betake myself by berth again directing the mate to whom i wished to give some orders should be sent to me to my utter astonishment and consternation word was brought me after a short time 
that he was nowhere to be found i hastened upon deck ordered all hands up again and questioned every man in the ship upon the subject but they with one accord declared they had not seen the mate forward lanterns were then brought and every accessible part of the vessel was unavailingly searched i then in the hearing of the whole crew declared my belief that he must have fallen overboard by accident again dismissed one watch below and repaired to the cabin in a state of mental agitation impossible to be described for notwithstanding the opinion which i had expressed to the contrary i could not but entertain strong suspicions that the unfortunate man had met a violent death the second mate was a protege of mine and as i have before observed was a very young man of not much experience as a seaman i therefore felt that under critical circumstances my main support had fallen from me it is needless to add that a deep sense of forlornness and insecurity was the result of these reflections my first step was to load and deposit in my stateroom all the firearms on board amounting to several muskets and four pairs of pistols the steward was a faithful mulatto man who had sailed with me several voyages to him i communicated my suspicions and directed him to be constantly on the alert and should any further difficulty with the crew occur to repair immediately to my stateroom and arm himself his usual berth was in the steerage but i further directed that he should on the following morning clear out and occupy one of the cabin near my own the second mate occupied a small stateroom opening into the passage which led from the steerage to the cabin i called him from the deck gave him a pair of loaded pistols with orders to keep them in his berth and during his night watches on deck never to go forward of the mainmast but to continue as constantly as possible near the cabin companionway and call me upon the slightest occasion after this i lay down on my bed ordering that i should be called at four o'clock for the morning watch only a few minutes had elapsed when i heard three or four knocks under the counter of the ship which is that part of the stern immediately under the cabin windows in a minute or two they were distinctly repeated i arose opened the cabin window and called the mate answered i gave him the end of a rope to assist him up and never shall i forget the flood of gratitude which my delighted soul poured forth to that being who had restored him to me uninjured his story was soon told he had gone forward upon being ordered by me after the calling of all hands and had barely reached the forecastle when he was seized by the two foreigners and before he could utter more than one cry which was drowned in the roaring of the winds and waves was thrown over the bow he was a powerful man and an excellent swimmer the topsails of the ship were clued down to reef and her way of course considerably lessened and in an instant he found the end of a rope which was accidentally towing overboard within his grasp by which he dragged in the dead water or eddy that is created under the stern of a vessel while sailing particularly if she is full built and deeply laden as was the case with this by desperate effort he caught one of the rudder chains which was very low and drew himself by it upon the step or jog of the rudder where he had sufficient presence of mind to remain without calling out until the light had ceased to shine through the cabin windows when he concluded that the search for him was over he then made the signal to me no being in the ship but myself was apprised of his safety for the gale had increased and completely drowned the sounds of the knocking opening the window etc before they could reach the quarter-deck and there was no one in the cabin but ourselves the steward having retired to his cabin in the steerage it was once again resolved that the second mate only should be informed of his existence he immediately betook himself 
to a large vacant stateroom and for the remainder of the passage all his wants were attended to by me even the steward was allowed to enter the cabin as rarely as possible nothing of note occurred during the remainder of the voyage which was prosperous it seemed that the foreigners had only been actuated by revenge in the violence they had committed for nothing further was attempted by them in due season we took a pilot in the channel and in a day or two entered the port of liverpool as soon as the proper arrangements were made we commenced warping the ship into dock and while engaged in this operation the mate appeared on deck went forward and attended to his duties as usual a scene occurred which is beyond description every feature of it as is vivid in my recollection as though it occurred but yesterday and will be to the latest breath the warp dropped from the paralyzed hands of the horror-stricken sailors and had it not been taken up by some boatman on board i should have been compelled to anchor again and procure assistance from the shore not a word was uttered but the two guilty wretches staggered to the mainmast where they remained petrified with horror until the officer who had been sent for approached to take them into custody they then seemed in a measure to be recalled to a sense of their appalling predicament and uttered the most piercing expressions of lamentation and despair they were soon tried and upon testimony of the mate capitally convicted and executed end of chapter twenty six an escape through the cabin windows chapter twenty seven of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by melvin lee thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous chapter twenty seven tom kringle's log we had refitted and been four days at sea on our voyage to jamaica when the gun-room officers gave our mess a blow-out the increased motion and rushing of the vessel through the water the groaning of the masts the howling of the gale and the frequent trampling of the watch on deck were prophetic of wet jackets to some of us still midshipman like we were as happy as a good dinner and some wine could make us until the old gunner shoved his weather-beaten fizz and bald pate in at the door beg pardon mr splinter but if you will spare mr kringle on the forecastle an hour until the moon rises spare quoth he is his majesty's officer a joint stool why mr kennedy why here ma'am take a glass of grog i thank you sir it is coming on a roughish night sir the running ship should be crossing us hereabouts indeed more than once i thought there was a strange sail close aboard of us the scud is flying so low and in such white flakes and none of us have an eye like mr kringle unless it be john crow and he is still all about frozen well tom i suppose you will go anglish from a first lieutenant to a mid brush instanter having changed my uniform for shag trousers pea jacket and a southwest cap i went forward and took my station in no pleasant humor on the stowed jib and my arm around the stay i had been half an hour there the weather was getting worse the rain was beating on my face and the spray from the stern was splashing over me as it roared through the waste of sparkling and hissing waters i turned my back to the weather for a moment to press my hands on my straining eyes when i opened them i saw the gunner's gaunt and high-featured visage thrust anxiously forward his profile looked as if rubbed over with phosphorus and his whole person as if we had been playing the snapdragon what has come over you mr kennedy who's burning the blue light now a wiser man than i must tell you that look forward mr kringle look there what do your books say to that 
I looked forth and saw at the extreme end of the jib boom what I have read of certainly, but never expected to see. A pale, Tom Gringle, zlog greenish glow worm colored flame, of the size and shape of the frosted glass shade over the swinging lamp in the gun room. It drew out and flattened as the vessel pitched and rose again, and as she sheared about, it wavered round the point that seemed to attract it, like a soap suds bubble blown from a tobacco pipe, before it is shaken into the air. At the core it was comparatively bright, but faded into a halo. It shed a baleful of ominous light on the surrounding objects. The group of sailors on the forecastle looked like specters, and they shrunk together and whispered, when it began to roll slowly along the spar where the boatswain mate was sitting at my feet. At this instant, something slid down the stay, and a cold, clammy hand passed around my neck. I was within an ace of losing my hold and tumbling overboard. Heaven have mercy on me! What's that? It's that skylarking son of a gun, Jim Sparkle's monkey, sir. You, Jim, you'll never rest till that brood is made shark's bait. But Jacko vanished up the stay again, and chuckling and grinning in the ghastly radiance, as if he had been the spirit of the lamp. The light was still there, but a cloud of mist, like a burst of vapor from a steam boiler, came down upon the gale and flew past, when it disappeared. I followed the white mass as it sailed down the wind. It did not, as it appeared to me, vanish in the darkness, but seemed to remain in sight to leeward, as if checked by a sudden flaw. Yet none of our sails were taken back. A thought flashed on me. I peered still more intensely into the night. I was not certain. A sail, broad on the lee bow, the captain answered from the quarter-deck, Thank you, Mr. Kringle. How shall we steer? Keep her away a couple of points, sir, steady. Steady, sung the man at the helm, and a slow, melancholy cadence, although a familiar sound to me, now moaned through the rushing wind, and smote upon my heart as if it had been the wailing of a spirit. I turned to the boatswain, who was now standing beside me. Is that you or Davy steering, Mr. Nipper? If you had not been there bodily at my side, I could have sworn that it was your voice. When the gunner made the same remark, it started the poor fellow. He tried to take it as a joke, but could not. There may be a laced hammock with a shot in it for some of us ere morning. At this moment, to my dismay, the object we were chasing shortened, gradually fell a beam of us, and finally disappeared. The Flying Dutchman! I can't see her at all now. She will be a fore and aft rig vessel that has tacked, sir and sure enough after a few seconds i saw the white object lengthened and drew out again abaft our beam the chase is tacked sir put the helm down or she will go to windward of us we tacked also and time it was we did so for the rising moon now showed us a large schooner with a crowd of sail we edged down on her when finding her maneuver detected she brailed up her flat sails and bore up before the wind this was our best point of sailing, and we cracked on, the captain rubbing his hands. It's my turn to be the big un this time. Although blowing a strong nor'wester, it was now clear moonlight, and we hammered away from our bow guns. But whenever a shot told amongst the rigging, the injury was repaired, as if by magic. It was evident we had repeatedly hulled her from the glimmering white streaks across her counter and along her stern occasioned by the splintering of the timber but it seemed to produce no effect at length we drew well upon her quarter she continued all black hull and white sail not a soul to be seen on deck except a dark object which we took for the man at the helm what schooner is that no answer heave to or i'll sink you still all silent sergeant armstrong do you think you can pick off that chap at the wheel the mariner jumped on the forecastle and leveled his piece 
when a musket shot from the schooner crashed through his skull and he fell dead the old skipper's blood was up forecastle there mr nipper clap a canister of grape over the round shot in the bow again and give it to him aye aye sir gleefully rejoined the boatswain forgetting the augury and everything else in the excitement of the moment in a twinkling the square foresail topgallant royal and studding sail halyards were let go on board the schooner as if to round two rake him sir or give him the stern he has not surrendered i know their game give him your broadside sir or he is off to windward of you like a shot no no we have him now heave to mr splinter heave to we did so and that so suddenly that the studding sail boom snapped like pipe shanks short off by the irons notwithstanding we had shot two hundred yards to the leeward before we could lay our main topsail to the mast i ran to windward the schooner's yards and rigging were now black with men clustering like bees swarming her square sails were being close furled her fore and aft sails set and away she was dead to windward of us so much for undervaluing our american friends grumbled mr splinter we made all sail in chase blazing away to little purpose we had no chance on a bowline and when our amigo had satisfied himself of his superiority by one or two short tacks he deliberately took a reef in his mainsail hauled down his flying jib and gaff topsail triced up the brunt of his foresail and fired his long thirty-two at us the shot came in our third aftermost port on the starboard side and dismounted the carronade smashing the slide and wounding three men the second missed as it was madness to remain to be peppered probably winged almost every one of ours fell short we reluctantly kept away on our course having the gratification of hearing a clear well-blown bugle on board the schooner playing up yankee doodle as the brig fell off our long gun was run out to have a parting crack at her when the third and last shot from the schooner struck the sill of the midship port and made the white spinters fly from the solid oak like bright silver sparks in the moonlight a sharp piercing cry rose in the air my soul identified that death shriek with the voice that i had heard and i saw the man who was standing with the lanyard of the lock in his hand drop heavily across the breach and discharged the gun in his fall thereupon a blood-red glare shot up in the cold blue sky as if a volcano had burst forth from beneath the mighty deep followed by a roar and a scattering crash and a mingling of unearthly cries and groans and a concussion of the air and the water as if our whole broadside had been fired at once then a solitary splash here and a dip there and a short sharp yells and low choking bubbling moans as if the hissing fragments of the noble vessel we had seen fell into the sea and the last of her gallant crew vanished forever beneath that pale broad moon we were alone and once more all was dark wild and stormy fearfully had that ball sped fired by a dead man's hand but what is it that clings black and doubled across the fatal cannon dripping and heavy and choking the scuppers with clotting gore and swaying to and fro with the motion of the vessel like a bloody fleece who is it that was hit at the gun there mr nipper the boatswain sir the last shot has cut him in two End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. 
Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 28 Loss of the Nautilus Sloop of War on a Rock in the Archipelago. A misunderstanding having originated between the court of Great Britain and the Ottoman port, a powerful squadron was ordered to proceed to Constantinople for the purpose of enforcing compliance with rational provisions. The object, however, proved abortive, and the expedition terminated in a way which did not enhance the reputation of these islands in the eyes of the Turks. Sir Thomas Lewis, commander of the squadron sent to the Dardanelles, having charged Captain Palmer with dispatches of the utmost importance for England, the Nautilus got under way at daylight on the 3rd of January, 1807. A fresh breeze from northeast carried her rapidly out of the Hellespont, passing the celebrated castles in the Dardanelles, which so severely galled the British. Soon afterwards she passed the island of Tenedos, off the north end of which two vessels of war were seen at anchor. They hoisted Turkish colors, and in return the Nautilus showed those of Britain. In the course of this day, many of the other islands abounding in the Greek archipelago came in sight, and in the evening the ship approached the island of Negropont, lying in 38, 30 north latitude, and 24, 8 east longitude. But now the navigation became more intricate, from the increasing number of islands and from the narrow entrance between Negropont and the island of Andros. The wind still continued to blow fresh, and as night was approaching, with the appearance of being dark and squally, the pilot, who was a Greek, wished to lie to until morning, which was done accordingly, and at daylight the vessel again proceeded. His course was shaped for the island of Falconera, in a track which had been so elegantly described by Falconer in a poem as far surpassing the uncouth productions of modern times, as the Ionian temples surpassed those flimsy structures contributing to render the fame of the originals eternal. This island and that of Antimilo were made in the evening, the latter distant fourteen or sixteen miles from the more extensive island of Milo, which could not then be seen from the thickness and haziness of the weather the pilot never having been beyond the present position of the nautilus and declaring his ignorance of the further bearings now relinquished his charge which was resumed by the captain all possible attention was paid to the navigation and captain palmer after seeing falconera so plainly and anxious to fulfil his mission with the greatest expedition resolved to stand on during the night he was confident of clearing the archipelago by morning and himself pricked the course from the chart which was to be steered by the vessel this he pointed out to his coxswain george smith of whose ability he entertained a high opinion then he ordered his bed to be prepared not having had his clothes off for the three preceding nights and having scarce had any sleep from the time of leaving the dardanelles a night of extreme darkness followed with vivid lightning constantly flashing in the horizon but this circumstance served to inspire the captain with a greater degree of confidence, for being enabled by it to see so much further at intervals, he thought, that should the ship approach any land, the danger would be discovered in sufficient time to be avoided. The wind continued still increasing, and though the ship carried but little sail, she went at the rate of nine miles an hour, being assisted by a lofty following sea, which with the brightness of the lightning made the night particularly awful at half past two in the morning high land was distinguished which those who saw it supposed to be the island of Saragato, and thence thought all safe and that every danger had been left behind the ship's course was altered to pass the island and she continued on her course until half past four at the changing of the watch when the man on the lookout exclaimed breakers ahead and immediately the vessel struck with a most tremendous crash such was the violence of the shock that people were thrown from their beds and on coming upon deck were obliged to cling to the cordage all was now confusion and alarm the crew hurried on deck which they had scarce time to do when the ladders below gave way and indeed left many persons struggling in the water which already rushed into the under part of the ship the captain it appeared had not gone to bed and immediately came on deck when the nautilus struck there having examined her situation, he immediately went round, accompanied by his second lieutenant, Mr. Nesbitt, and endeavored to quiet the apprehensions of the people. He then returned to his cabin and burnt his papers and private signals. Meantime, every sea lifted up the ship, 
and then dashed her with irresistible force on the rocks and in a short time the crew were obliged to resort to the rigging where they remained an hour exposed to the surges incessantly breaking over them there they broke out into the most lamentable exclamations for their parents children and kindred and the distresses they themselves endured the weather was so dark and hazy that the rocks could be seen only at a very small distance and in two minutes afterwards the ship had struck at this time the lightning had ceased but the darkness of the night was such that the people could not see the length of the ship from them their only hope rested in the falling of the mainmast which they trusted would reach a small rock which was discovered very near them accordingly about half an hour before daybreak the mainmast gave way providentially falling towards the rock and by means of it they were enabled to gain the land the struggles and confusion to which this incident gave birth can better be conceived than described some of the crew were drowned one man had his arm broke and many were cruelly lacerated but captain palmer refused to quit his station while any individual remained on board and not until the whole of his people had gained the rock did he endeavor to save himself at that time in consequence of remaining by the wreck he had received considerable personal injury and must infallibly have perished had not some of the seamen ventured through a tremendous sea to his assistance the boats were staved in pieces several of the people endeavored to haul in the jolly boat which they were incapable of accomplishing the hull of the vessel being interposed sheltered the shipwrecked crew a long time from the beating of the surf but as she broke up their situation became more perilous every moment and they soon found that they should be obliged to abandon the small portion of the rock which they had reached and wade to another apparently somewhat larger the first lieutenant by watching the breaking of the seas had got safely thither and it was resolved by the rest to follow his example scarce was this resolution formed and attempted to be put into execution when the people encountered an immense quantity of loose spars which were immediately washed into the channel which they had to pass but necessity would admit of no alternative many in crossing between the two rocks were severely wounded and they suffered more in this undertaking than in gaining the first rock from the ship the loss of their shoes was now felt in particular for the sharp rocks tore their feet in a dreadful manner and the legs of some were covered with blood daylight beginning to appear disclosed the horrors by which those unfortunate men were surrounded the sea was covered with the wreck of their ill-fated ship many of their unhappy comrades were seen floating away on spars and timbers and the dead and dying were mingled together without a possibility of the survivors affording assistance to any that might still be rescued two short hours had been productive of all this misery the ship destroyed and her crew reduced to a situation of despair their wild and affrighted looks indicated the sensations by which they were agitated but on being recalled to a sense of their real condition they saw that they had nothing left but resignation to the will of heaven the shipwrecked mariners now discovered that they were cast away on a coral rock almost level with the water about three or four hundred yards long and two hundred broad they were at least twelve miles from the nearest islands which were afterwards found to be those of Saragato and Pera on the north end of candia about thirty miles distant at this time it was reported that a small boat with several men had escaped and although the fact was true the uncertainty of her fate induced those on the rock to confide in being relieved by any vessel accidentally passing in sight of a signal of distress they had hoisted on a long pole the neighboring islands being too distant the weather had been extremely cold and the day preceding the shipwreck ice had lain on the deck now to resist its inclemency a fire was made by means of a knife and flint preserved in the pocket of one of the sailors and with much difficulty some damp powder from a small barrel washed on shore was kindled a kind of tent was next made with pieces of old canvas boards and such things as could be got about the wreck and the people were thus enabled to dry the few clothes they had saved but they passed a long and comfortless night though partly consoled with the hope of their fire being descried in the dark and taking for a signal of distress nor was this hope altogether disappointed when the ship first struck a small whaleboat was hanging over the quarter into which an officer george smith the coxswain and nine men immediately got and lowering themselves into the water happily escaped after rowing three or four leagues against a very high sea and the wind blowing hard they reached the small island of Pera. 
This proved to be scarce a mile in circuit, and containing nothing but a few sheep and goats, belonging to the inhabitants of Sarago, who come in the summer months to carry away their young. They could find no fresh water, except a small residue from rain in the hole of a rock, and that was barely sufficient, though most sparingly used. During the night, having observed the fire above mentioned, the party began to conjecture that some of their shipmates might have been saved, for until then they had deemed their destruction inevitable. The coxswain, impressed with this opinion, proposed again hazarding themselves in the boat for their relief, and, although some feeble objections were offered against it, he continued resolute to his purpose, and persuaded four others to accompany him. About nine in the morning of Tuesday, the second day of the shipwreck, the approach in the little whale-boat was descried by those on the rock. All uttered an exclamation of joy, and in return the surprise of the coxswain and his crew to find so many of their shipmates still surviving is not to be described. But the surf ran so high as to endanger the safety of the boat, and several of the people imprudently endeavored to get into it. The coxswain tried to persuade Captain Palmer to come to him, but he steadily refused, saying, No, Smith, save your unfortunate shipmates, never mind me. After some little consultation, he desired him to take the Greek pilot on board and make the best of his way to Saragato, where the pilot said there were some families of fishermen who doubtless would relieve their necessities. But it appeared as if heaven had ordained the destruction of this unfortunate crew, for soon after the boat departed, the wind began to increase, and dark clouds gathering around excited among those remaining behind all their apprehensions for a frightful storm. In about two hours it commenced with the greatest fury. The waves rose considerably, and soon destroyed the fire. They nearly covered the rock, and compelled the men to fly to the highest part for refuge, which was the only one that could afford any shelter. There nearly ninety people passed a night of the greatest horrors, and the only means of preventing themselves from being swept away by the surf, which every moment broke over them, was by a small rope fastened round the summit of the rock, and with difficulty holding on by each other. The fatigues which the people had previously undergone, added to what they now endured, proved too overpowering to many of their number. Several became delirious. Their strength was exhausted, and they could hold on no longer. Their afflictions were still further aggravated by an apprehension that the wind, veering more to the north, would raise the sea to their present situation, in which case a single wave would have swept them all into oblivion. The hardships which the crew had already suffered were sufficient to terminate existence, and many had met with deplorable accidents. One in particular, while crossing the channel between the rocks at an unsuitable time, was dashed against them so as to be nearly scalped, and exhibited a dreadful spectacle to his companions. He lingered out the night, and next morning expired. The more fortunate survivors were but ill prepared to meet the terrible effects of famine their strength enfeebled, their bodies unsheltered and abandoned by hope, nor were they less alarmed for the fate of their boat. The storm came on before she could have reached the intended island, and on her safety their own depended, but the scene which daylight presented was still more deplorable. The survivors beheld the corpses of their departed shipmates, and some still in the agonies of death. They were themselves altogether exhausted, from the sea all night breaking over them, and the inclemency of the weather, which was such that many, among whom was the carpenter, perished from excessive cold. But this unfortunate crew had now to suffer a mortification, and to witness an instance of inhumanity which leaves an eternal stain of infamy on those who merit the reproach. Soon after day broke, they observed a vessel with all sail set, coming down before the wind, steering directly for the rock. They made every possible signal of distress which their feeble condition admitted, nor without effect, for they were at last seen by the vessel which bore to and hoisted out her boat. The joy which this occasioned may be easily conceived, for nothing short of immediate relief was anticipated, and they hastily made preparation for rafts to carry them through the surf, confident that the boat was provided with whatever might administer to their necessities. Approaching still nearer, she came within pistol-shot, full of men dressed in a European fashion, who, after having gazed at them a few minutes, the person who steered waved his hat to them, and then rode off to his ship. 
The pain of the shipwrecked people at this barbarous proceeding was acute, and heightened even more by beholding the stranger vessel employed the whole day in taking up the floating remains of that less fortunate one which had so lately borne them. Perhaps the abandoned wretches, guilty of so unfeeling an act, may one day be disclosed, and it would surely excite little compassion to learn that they suffered that retribution which such inhuman conduct merits that people dressed in the habit of englishmen though belonging to a different nation could take advantage of misery instead of relieving it will scarce seem creditable at the present day were not some instances of a similar nature related elsewhere than in these volumes after this cruel disappointment and bestowing an anathema which the barbarity of the strangers deserved the thoughts of the people were during the remainder of the day directed towards the return of the boat and being disappointed there also their dread that she had been lost was only further confirmed they began to yield to despondency and had the gloomy prospect of certain death before them thirst then became intolerable and in spite of being warned against it by instances of the terrific effects ensuing some in desperation resorted to salt water their companions had soon the grief of learning what they would experience by following their example in a few hours raging madness followed and nature could struggle no longer another awful night was to be passed yet the weather being considerably more moderate the sufferers entertained hopes that it would be less disastrous than the one preceding and to preserve themselves from the cold they crowded close together and covered themselves with their few remaining rags but the ravings of their comrades who had drank salt water were truly horrible all endeavors to quiet them were ineffectual and the power of sleep lost its influence in the middle of the night they were unexpectedly hailed by the crew of the whaleboat but the only object of the people on the rock was water they cried out to their shipmates for it though in vain earthen vessels only could have been procured and these would not bear being conveyed through the surf the coxswain then said they should be taken off the rock by a fishing vessel in the morning and with this assurance they were forced to be content it was some consolation to know that the boat was safe and that relief had so far been obtained all the people anxiously expected morning and for the first time since being on the rock the sun cheered them with its rays still the fourth morning came and no tidings either of the boat or vessel the anxiety of the people increased for inevitable death from famine was staring them in the face what were they to do for self-preservation the misery and hunger which they endured were extreme they were not ignorant of the means whereby other unfortunate mariners in the like situation had protracted life yet they viewed them with disgust still when they had no alternative they considered their urgent necessities and found them affording some excuse offering prayers to heaven for forgiveness of the sinful act they selected a young man who had died the preceding night and ventured to appease their hunger with human flesh whether the people were relieved is uncertain for towards evening death had made hasty strides among them and many brave men drooped under their hardships among these were the captain and first lieutenant two meritorious officers and the sullen silence now preserved by the survivors shewed the state of their internal feelings captain palmer was in the twenty-sixth year of his age amidst his endeavors to comfort those under his command his companions in misfortune his personal injuries were borne with patience and resignation and no murmurs escaped his lips his virtuous life was prematurely closed by the overwhelming severities of the lamentable catastrophe he had shared during the course of another tedious night many suggested the possibility of constructing a raft which might carry the survivors to Cerigato, and the wind being favorable might enable them to reach that island at all events attempting this seemed preferable to remaining on the rock to expire of hunger and thirst accordingly at daylight they prepared to put their plan in execution a number of the larger spars were lashed together and sanguine hopes of success entertained at length the moment of launching the raft arrived but it was only to distress the people with new disappointments for a few moments sufficed for the destruction of a work on which the strongest of the party had been occupied hours several from this unexpected failure became still more desperate and five resolved to trust themselves on a few small spars slightly lashed together and on which they had scarce room to stand bidding their companions adieu 
they launched out into the sea where they were speedily carried away by unknown currents and vanished forever from sight towards the same afternoon the people were again rejoiced by the sight of the whaleboat and the coxswain told them that he had experienced great difficulty in prevailing on the greek fishermen of Saragato to venture in their boats from dread of the weather neither would they permit him to take them unaccompanied by themselves he regretted what his comrades had endured and his grief at not being able yet to relieve them but encouraged them with hopes if the weather remained fine that next day the boats might come while the coxswain spoke this twelve or fourteen men imprudently plunged from the rock into the sea and very nearly reached the boat two indeed got so far as to be taken in one was drowned and the rest providentially recovered their former station those who thus escaped could not but be envied by their companions while they reproached the indiscretion of the others who had they reached the boat would without all doubt have sunk her and thus unwittingly consigned the whole to irremediable destruction the people were wholly occupied in reflections on the passing incidents but their weakness increased as the day elapsed one of the survivors describes himself as feeling the approach of annihilation that his sight failed and his senses became confused that his strength was exhausted and his eyes turned towards the setting sun under the conviction that he should never see it rise again yet on the morning he survived and he was surprised that providence willed it should still be so as several strong men had fallen in the course of the night while the remainder were contemplating their forlorn condition and judging this the last day of their lives the approach of the boats was unexpectedly announced from the lowest ebb of despair they were now elated with the most extravagant joy and copious draughts of water quickly landed refreshed their languid bodies never before did they know the blessings which the single possession of water could afford it tasted more delicious than the finest wines anxious preparations were made for immediate departure from a place which had been fatal to so many unhappy sufferers of one hundred and twenty-two persons on board the nautilus when she struck fifty-eight had perished eighteen were drowned it was supposed at the moment of the catastrophe and one in attempting to reach the boat five were lost on the small raft and thirty-four died of famine about fifty now embarked in four fishing vessels and landed the same evening at the island of Saragato, making it altogether sixty-four individuals including those who escaped in the whaleboat six days had been passed on the rock nor had the people during that time received any assistance excepting from the human flesh of which they had participated the survivors landed at a small creek in the island of Saragato, after which they had to go a considerable distance before reaching the dwellings of their friends their first care was to send for the master's mate who had escaped to the island of pori and had been left behind when the whaleboat came down to the rock he and his companions had exhausted all the fresh water but lived on the sheep and goats which they caught among the rocks and had drank their blood there they had remained in a state of great uncertainty concerning the fate of those who had left them in the boat though the greeks could not aid the seamen in the care of their wounds they treated them with great care and hospitality but medical assistance being important from the pain the sufferers endured and having nothing to bind up their wounds but shirts which they tore into bandages they were eager to reach Sarago. the island of Saragato, where they had landed was a dependency on the other about fifteen miles long ten broad and of a barren and unproductive soil with little cultivation twelve or fourteen families of greek fishermen dwelt upon it as the pilot had said who were in a state of extreme poverty their houses or rather huts consisting of one or two rooms on the same floor were in general built against the side of a rock the walls composed of clay and straw and the roof supported by a tree in the centre of the dwelling their food was a coarse kind of bread formed of boiled peas and flour which was made into a kind of paste for the strangers with once or twice a bit of kid and that was all which they could expect from their deliverers but they made a liquor from corn which having an agreeable flavor and being a strong spirit was drank with avidity by the sailors Sarago was about twenty-five miles distant and there it was also said an english consul resided eleven days elapsed however before the crew could leave Saragato from the difficulty of persuading the greeks to adventure to sea in their frail barks during tempestuous weather the wind at last proving fair with a smooth sea they bade a grateful adieu to the families of their deliverers 
who were tenderly affected by their distresses and shed tears of regret when they departed in six or eight hours they reached sarago where they were received with open arms immediately on arrival they were met by the english vice-consul signor manuel colucci a native of the island who devoted his house bed credit and whole attention to their service and the survivors unite in declaring their inability to express the obligations under which he laid them the governor commandant bishop and principal people all shewed equal hospitality care and friendship and exerted themselves to render the time agreeable insomuch that it was with no little regret that these shipwrecked mariners thought of forsaking the island after the people had remained three weeks at sarago they learnt that a russian ship of war lay at anchor off the morea about twelve leagues distant being driven in by bad weather and immediately sent letters to her commanding officer narrating their misfortunes and soliciting a passage to corfu the master of the nautilus determining to make the most of the opportunity took a boat to reach the russian vessel but he was at first so unfortunate as to be blown on the rocks in a heavy gale of wind where he nearly perished and the boat was staved in pieces however he luckily got to the ship and after some difficulty succeeded in procuring the desired passage for himself and his companions to corfu her commander to accommodate them came down to sarago and anchored at a small port called st nicholas at the eastern extremity of the island the english embarked on the fifth but owing to contrary winds did not sail until the fifteenth of february when they bade farewell to their friends they next touched at zante another small island abounding in currants and olives the oil from the latter of which constitutes the chief riches of the people after remaining there four days they sailed for corfu where they arrived on the second of march eighteen o seven nearly two months after the date of their shipwreck End of chapter 28、chapter、twenty nine of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter twenty nine Wreck of a Slave Ship. The following extract of a letter from Philadelphia, dated November eleventh, seventeen sixty two, gives an account of the melancholy disaster that befell the Phoenix, Captain Magotcher, in latitude thirty seven degrees north and longitude seventy two degrees west from London, bound to Potomac in Maryland from the coast of Africa with three hundred thirty two slaves on board. On Wednesday, the twentieth of October, seventeen sixty two, at six o'clock in the evening, came on a most violent gale of wind at south, with thunder and lightning, the sea running very high when the ship sprung a leak, and we were obliged to lie to under bare poles. The water gained on us with both pumps constantly working. ten p m. Endeavoured to put the ship before the wind to no purpose. At twelve, the sand ballast having choked our pumps, and there being seven feet water in the hold, all the casks afloat and the ballast shifted to leeward, cut away the rigging of the main and mizzen masts, both of which went instantly close by the deck, and immediately after the foremast was carried away about twenty feet above. Hove overboard all our guns, upon which the ship righted a little. We were then under a necessity of letting all our slaves out of irons to assist in pumping and bailing. Thursday morning, being moderate, having gained about three feet on the ship, we found every cask in the hold stove to pieces so that we only saved a barrel of flour, ten pounds of bread, twenty five gallons of wine, beer, and shrub, and twenty five gallons of spirits. The seamen and slaves were employed all this day in pumping and bailing. The pumps were frequently choked and brought up great quantities of sand. We were obliged to hoist one of the pumps up and put it down the quarter deck hatchway. A ship this day bore down upon us, and, though very near and we making every signal of distress, she would not speak to us. On Friday, the men slaves, being very sullen and unruly, having had no sustenance of any kind for forty eight hours except a dram, We put one half of the strongest of them in irons. On Saturday and Sunday, all hands night and day could scarce keep the ship clear and were constantly under arms. 
On Monday morning many of the slaves had got out of irons and were attempting to break up the gratings, and the seamen, not daring to go down in the hold to clear the pumps, we were obliged for the preservation of our own lives to kill fifty of the ringleaders and stoutest of them. It is impossible to describe the misery the poor slaves underwent having had no fresh water for five days. Their dismal cries and shrieks and most frightful looks added a great deal to our misfortunes. Four of them were found dead, and one drowned herself in the hold. This evening the water gained on us, and three seamen dropped down with fatigue and thirst which could not be quenched, though wine, rum, and shrub were given them alternately. On Thursday morning the ship gained, during the night, above a foot of water, and the seamen quite worn out and many of them in despair. About ten in the forenoon we saw a sail. About two she discovered us and bore down. At five spoke to us, being the King George of Londonderry, James Mackay, master. He immediately promised to take us on board and hoisted out his yawl, it then blowing very fresh. The gale increasing prevented him from saving anything but the white people's lives, not even any of our clothes or one slave, the boat being scarcely able to live in the sea the last trip she made. Captain Mackay and some gentlemen, passengers he had on board, treated us with kindness and humanity. End of chapter 29 Wreck of a Slave Ship Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 30 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. The Wrecked Seaman. The annexed thrilling sketch is extracted from The Life of a Sailor by a captain in the British Navy. It relates to the exposures of the crew of the Magpie, who had taken to the boat after their shipwreck on the coast of Cuba. The boat was upset. The storm continues. Even in this moment of peril, the discipline of the Navy assumed its command. At the order from the lieutenant for the men on the keel to relinquish their position, they instantly obeyed. The boat was turned over, and once more the expedient was tried, but quite in vain. For no sooner had the two men begun to bail with a couple of hats, and the safety of the crew to appear within the bounds of probability, than one man declared he saw the fin of a shark. No language can convey the idea of the panic which seized the struggling seamen. A shark is at all times an object of horror to a sailor, and those who have seen the destructive jaws of this voracious fish, and their immense and almost incredible power, their love of blood, and their bold and daring to obtain it, alone can form an idea of the sensations produced in a swimmer by the cry of, A shark! A shark! Every man now struggled to obtain a moment's safety. Well they knew that one drop of blood would have been scented by the everlasting pilot fish, the jackals of the shark, and that their destruction was inevitable, if one only of these monsters should discover this rich repast, or be led to its food by the little rapid hunter of its prey. All discipline now was unavailing. The boat again turned keel up. One man only gained his security to be pushed from it by others, and thus their strength began to fail from long-continued exertion. However, as the enemy so much dreaded did not make its appearance, Smith once more urged them to endeavor to save themselves by the only means left, that of the boat. But as he knew that he would only increase their alarm by endeavoring to persuade them that sharks did not abound in these parts, he used the wisest plan of desiring those who held on by the gunwale, to keep splashing in the water with their legs, in order to frighten the monsters, at which they were so alarmed. Once more had hope begun to dawn. The boat was clear to her thwarts, and four men were in her hard at work, a little forbearance and a little obedience, and they were all safe. At this moment, 
when those in the water urged their messmates in the boat to continue bailing with unremitted exertion a noise was heard close to them and about fifteen sharks came right in amongst them the panic was ten times more dreadful than before the boat was once again upset by the simultaneous endeavor to escape the danger and the twenty-two sailors were again devoted to destruction at first the sharks did not seem inclined to seize their prey but swam in amongst the men playing in the water sometimes leaping about and rubbing against their victims this was of short duration a loud shriek from one of the men announced his sudden pain a shark had seized him by the leg and severed it entirely from the body no sooner had the blood been tasted than the long dreaded attack took place another and another shriek proclaimed a loss of limbs some were torn from the boat to which they vainly endeavored to cling some it was supposed sunk from fear alone all were in a dreadful peril mr smith even now when all of the horrible deaths the most horrible seemed to await him gave his orders with clearness and coolness and to the everlasting honor of the poor departed crew be it known they were obeyed again the boat was righted and again two men were in her incredible as it may appear still however it is true that the voice of the officer was heard amidst the danger and the survivors actually as before clung to the gunwale and kept the boat upright mr smith himself held on to the stern and cheered and applauded his men the sharks had tasted the blood and were not to be driven from their feast in one short moment when mr smith ceased splashing as he looked into the boat to watch the progress a shark seized both legs and bit them off just above the knees human nature was not strong enough to bear the immense pain without a groan but mr smith endeavored to conceal the misfortune nature true to herself resisted the endeavor and the groan was deep and audible the crew had long respected their gallant commander they knew his worth and his courage on hearing him express his pain and seeing him relinquish his hold to sink two of the men grasped their dying officer and placed him in the stern sheets even now in almost insupportable agony that gallant fellow forgot his own suffering and thought only on rescuing the remaining few from the untimely grave which awaited them he told them again of their only hope deplored their perilous state and concluded with these words if any of you survive this fatal night and return to jamaica tell the admiral sir lawrence halstead that i was in search of the pirate when this lamentable occurrence took place tell him i hope i have always done my duty and that i here the endeavor of some of the men to get into the boat gave her a heel on one side the men who were supporting poor smith relinquished him for a moment and he rolled overboard and was drowned his last bubbling cry was soon lost amid the shrieks of his former companions he sunk to rise no more at eight o'clock in the evening the magpie was upset it was calculated by the two survivors that their companions had all died by nine the sharks seemed satisfied for the moment and they with gallant hearts resolved to profit by the precious time in order to save themselves they righted the boat and one getting over the bows and the other over the stern they found themselves although nearly exhausted yet alive and in comparative security they began the work of bailing and soon lightened the boat sufficiently not to be easily upset when both sat down to rest the return of the sharks was a signal for their return to labor their voracious monsters endeavored to upset the boat they swam by its side in seeming anxiety for their prey but after waiting some time they separated the two rescued seamen found themselves free from their insatiable enemies and by the blessing of god saved tired as they were they continued their labor until the boat was nearly dry when both lay down to rest the one forward and the other aft so completely had fear operated on their minds that they did not dare even to move dreading that an incautious step might have capsized the boat they soon in spite of the horrors they had witnessed fell into a sound sleep 
and day had dawned before they awoke to horrible reflections and apparently worse dangers the sun rose clear and unclouded the cool calm of the night was followed by the sultry calm of the morning and heat hunger thirst and fatigue seemed to settle on the unfortunate men rescued by providence and their own exertions from the jaws of a horrible death they awoke and looked at each other the very gaze of despair was appalling far as the eye could reach no object could be discerned the bright haze of the morning added to the strong refraction of light one smooth interminable plain one endless ocean one cloudless sky and one burning sun were all they had to gaze upon the boat lay like the ark in a world alone they had no oar no mast no sail nothing but the bare planks and themselves without provisions or water food or raiment they lay upon the calm ocean hopeless friendless and miserable it was a time of intense anxiety their eyes rested upon each other in silent pity not unmixed with fear each knew the dreadful alternative to which nature would urge them the cannibal was already in their looks and fearful would have been the first attack on either side for they were both brave and stout men and equals in courage and strength it now being about half past six in the morning the sun was beginning to prove its burning power the sea was as smooth as a looking-glass and saving now and then the slight cat's paw of air which ruffled the face of the water for a few yards all was calm and hushed in vain they strained their eyes in vain they turned from side to side to escape the burning rays of the sun they could not sleep for now anxiety and fear kept both vigilant and on their guard they dared not to court sleep for that might have been the last mortal repose once they nearly quarrelled but fortunately the better feelings of humanity overcame the bitterness of despair the foremost man had long complained of thirst and had frequently dipped his hand into the water and sucked the fluid this was hastily done for all the horrors of the night were still before them and not unfrequently the sharp fin of a shark was seen not far off from the boat in the midst of the excruciating torments of thirst heightened by the salt in the water and in the irritable temper of the bowman as he stamped his impatient feet against the bottom boards and tore his hair with unfeeling indifference he suddenly stopped the expression of rage and called out a sail whilst they stood watching in silence the approach of the brig which slowly made her way through the water and at that very instant they were assuring each other that they were seen and that the vessel was purposely steered on the course she was keeping to reach them the whole fabric of hope was destroyed in a second the brig kept away about three points and began to make more sail then was it an awful moment their countenances saddened as they looked at each other for in vain they hailed in vain they threw their jackets in the air it was evident that they had never been seen and that the brig was steering her proper course the time was slipping away and if once they got abaft the beam of the brig every second would lessen the chance of being seen besides the sea breeze might come down and then she would be far away and beyond all hope in a quarter of an hour now was it that the man who had been so loudly lamenting his fate seemed suddenly inspired with fresh hope and courage he looked attentively at the brig and then as it, at his companion and said by heaven i'll do it or we are lost do what said his shipmate though said the first man it is no trifle to do after what we have seen and known and yet i will try for if she passes us what can we do i tell you jack i'll swim to her if i get safe to her you are saved if not why i shall die with without adding perhaps murder to my crimes what jump overboard and leave me all alone replied his companion look look at that shark which has followed us all night why it is only waiting for you to get into the water to swallow you as it did perhaps half our messmates no no wait do wait perhaps another vessel may come besides i cannot swim half the distance and i should be afraid to remain behind think tom think only of the sharks and of last night 
he jumped overboard with as much calmness as if he was bathing in security no sooner had he begun to strike out in the direction he intended than his companion turned toward the sharks the first had disappeared and it was evident that they had heard the splash and would soon follow their prey it is hard to say who suffered most anxiety the one left in the boat cheered by his companion looked at the brig and kept waving his jacket but then turned to watch the sharks his horror may be imagined when he saw three of these terrific monsters swim past the boat exactly in the direction of his companion he splashed his jacket in the water to scare them away but they seemed quite aware of the impotency of the attack and lazily pursued their course the man swam well and strongly there was no doubt he would pass within hail of the brig provided the sharks did not interfere and he knowing that they would not be long in following him kept kicking in the water and splashing as he swam there is no fish more cowardly and yet more desperately savage than a shark i have seen one harpooned twice with a hook in his jaws and come again to fresh bait yet will they suffer themselves to be scared by the smallest noise and hardly ever take their prey without its quite still generally speaking any place surrounded by rocks where surf breaks although there may be no passage for a ship will be secure from sharks it was not until a great distance had been accomplished that the swimmer became apprised of his danger and saw by his side one of the terrific creatures still however he bravely swam and kicked his mind was made up for the worst and he had little hope of success in the meantime the breeze had gradually freshened and the brig passed with greater velocity through the water every stitch of canvas was spread to the poor swimmer the sails seemed bursting with breeze and as he used his utmost endeavour to propel himself so as to cut off the vessel the spray appeared to dash from the bow and the brig to fly through the sea he was now close enough to hope his voice might be heard but he hailed and hailed in vain not a soul was to be seen on deck the man who steered was too intent upon his avocation to listen to the call for mercy the brig passed and the swimmer was every second getting further in the distance every hope was gone not a ray of that bright divinity remained the fatigue had nearly exhausted him and the sharks only waited for the first quiet moment to swallow their victim it was in vain he thought of his returning toward the boat for he never could have reached her and his companion had no means of assisting him the act of offering up his last prayer ere he made up his mind to float and be eaten he saw a man looking over the quarter of the brig he raised both his hands he jumped himself up in the water and by the singularity of his motions fortunately attracted notice a telescope soon made clear the object the brig was hove to a boat sent and the man saved the attention of the crew was then awakened to the magpie's boat she was soon alongside and thus through the bold exertions of as gallant a fellow as ever breathed both were rescued from their perilous situation End of chapter